In today's video, I'm going to show you guys the most effective way of solving pedigree problems. So let's do it. Hey guys, this is Mikey from AVO Prep Academy. And today we're going to be talking about pedigree, which comes at the end of Mendelian genetics. And what that means is by the time you get to this video, you should already be familiar with solving single locus Mendelian crosses. But even if that's not the case, perhaps some of the things that we're gonna talk about here today might help you develop those skills. So feel free to stick around. And if you're new here today, consider subscribing to our channel and perhaps clicking the like button. It helps us a ton. In AP Biology, there are three major types of inheritance patterns that you should be very familiar with. Now, there is one extra special one that I'm gonna talk about towards the end of this video, but the three that you have to know as a main are the autosomal recessive, autosomal dominant, and X-linked recessive disorders. And as I mentioned before, hopefully you would know that X-linked recessive disorders are disorders that are carried on the X chromosome, passed on unequally between the sons and daughters. Now for the important bit, what is the most effective way of identifying the inheritance pattern when looking at a pedigree? And the answer is through process of elimination. Now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna test any pedigree with the very first step, which is testing to see if it's X-linked recessive. Then we're gonna test to see if it's autosomal dominant, and then we're gonna test to see if it's autosomal recessive. And by taking those three steps, you should be able to identify what your pedigree is almost every single time. So without further ado, let's take a look at an example. Now in this unknown pedigree, we have three generations. And the first thing that I'm going to do is to test to see if this is X-linked recessive. One of the main tells of an X-linked recessive pattern is that males are disproportionately affected. But in this particular pedigree, we have four males and four females, allowing us to get rid of X-linked recessive inheritance as one of the possibilities. Now you might be wondering why X-linked recessive patterns are more prevalent in males rather than females. And that's something that we're gonna talk about a little bit later when we identify and genotype an X-linked condition. So stick around for that in just a few moments. But for now, let's actually get to the autosomal part. Because if we get rid of the X-linked recessive pattern, we still have to discern between the autosomal dominant and autosomal recessive. And this is what I'm gonna look for. I'm going to be looking to see if there are any affected individuals being born from unaffected parents. And in this particular pedigree, we see that individuals eight and nine produce an affected child, in which case, we we can say this is not an autosomal dominant disorder. Now, I can actually tell you why that's the case. Let's take a hypothetical and say that this was an autosomal dominant disorder. If it were to be an autosomal dominant disorder, individual eight and individual nine who are not shaded in, who are not affected, would have both recessive genotypes, let's say little a, little a, and little a, little a. If that's the case, then there's no way that a cross between two homozygous recessive individuals would result in the presence of a dominant allele in the next generation. Now, this is not counting for de novo mutations, and I get that could happen, but for most of what we're looking at in AP biology, this is almost a guarantee to get rid of autosomal dominant as a possibility, which means that by the time we get to this point, we can say that this is an autosomal recessive disorder. And because I have my computer right here with me, let's go ahead and genotype this together. In this image, what we can say is that this is in fact an autosomal recessive disorder from the process of elimination that we've just conducted, which means that the first thing that we can do is to genotype all of the affected individuals here as the homozygous recessive because they are in fact affected by this disorder, which means individuals one, four, five, 10, 11, 13, 17, 18, and 19 are all going to be homozygous recessive individuals. What we can also say is that any cross that results in the formation of a homozygous recessive individual, like for instance, individual number 10 and 11, must have parents who have at least one of those recessive alleles, which means that in the case of individual three, that person would have to be a heterozygous individual with that recessive allele hiding, but manifesting in the next generation. Furthermore, individuals nine and 12 must be heterozygous. And why is that? Well, first of all, they have to have one dominant allele because they do not have the disease. However, because their mother, individual number four, was a homozygous recessive, the mother would have had to give that recessive allele to both individuals nine and 12. Now, what about the rest? Well, let's take a look at what's happening in individuals six, seven, and eight. In individuals six, seven, and eight, none of them have the disorder. However, their father has the disorder. 
So that makes it likely that the mother, individual number two, was most likely a homozygous dominant individual, which means that there was absolutely no chance that any of the children from the cross between individual one and two would have had the disease, but they would all be carriers or heterozygous individuals. And that means individual six, seven, and eight are all heterozygous as well. And this actually makes sense because if individuals eight and nine were heterozygous, that gives them about a quarter probability of producing an affected child, in which case number 17, that individual having that disorder out of the three siblings that is part of that generation makes total sense. And that also means that individuals 15 and 16, well, we sort of don't know whether they're going to be heterozygous or homozygous dominant. So I'm just going to leave a placeholder here because without further information, there's just no way of knowing. Individual 14, however, we do know that person has to be a heterozygous individual because they themselves don't have the disorder, meaning that they have a dominant allele, but their mother, individual five, does have the disorder, meaning that a single recessive allele would have had to end up in her chromosome. So that's how you actually identify an autosomal recessive and genotype all of the individuals within. So now let's take a look at a slightly different pedigree. Again, in this pedigree, I'm going to start with the X-linked recessive pattern, and then I'm going to sort of work my way down. Is this X-linked recessive? And it appears that it's probably not. Yes, there are more males who are affected than females, but again, between four individuals and two individuals, that's not that big of a difference. I'm going to make the assumption that this is going to be an autosomal disorder. However, another thing that I see here is that there are absolutely no affected individuals being born from unaffected individuals. So I can't quite get rid of autosomal dominant. And that means I gotta stop there and test to see if that hypothesis is going to work out for us. And taking a closer look at this pedigree, it does seem to make sense that this is autosomal dominant. And why is that? Well, because firstly, you see that if the parents or if at least one parent has this disorder, then it provides a great likelihood that the second generation will have it as well. Another really important tell here is when looking at individuals seven and eight. You see, if this were to be an autosomal dominant disorder, which I think it is, then those individuals number three, seven, eight, 10, 11, and 12 must be homozygous recessive because they don't have that disorder. And what you see between individuals seven and eight is that if they were to be homozygous recessive, then none of their offsprings would have the disease. And what you would get is essentially an escape from this disorder where two unaffected individuals will never produce an offspring with that disorder for the very same reason we said that unaffected individuals cannot give rise to affected children in autosomal recessive disorders. So let's go ahead and genotype the individuals here. What's important to note about autosomal dominant disorders is that if you have a cross between two individuals that produce unaffected individuals, like in the case of parents one and two producing offspring number seven, it tells you right away that those parents are heterozygous. And that's because if individual one was big A little a and individual two was big A little a, that gives the quarter probability that you would still get a little a and little a ending up in individual seven, resulting in a non-disordered offspring. Now for individuals five and six, well, we don't really know whether they're going to be homozygous dominant or heterozygous. So we're gonna have to leave that blank for the time being. Now, going over to the right side of the family, we have individuals three and four. We know that individual three is a homozygous recessive. Individual four has to be a heterozygous individual. And that's because they had individual eight who received at least one recessive allele from parent three and one recessive allele from parent four. That makes parent four necessarily heterozygous. And that also means that individual nine has to be heterozygous because he would have received the recessive allele from parent number three while receiving the dominant allele from parent number four because individual nine does have the disorder. Now, when it comes to individuals 10, 11, and 12, they're all going to be homozygous recessive because they're not affected by this dominant disorder. Now, taking a look at the very last pedigree of the most common patterns here, what we see is definitely an X-linked recessive pattern. We see that only males are affected. And another big tell is that males are affected because of maternal inheritance. Now let's take a look at what that means by taking a closer look and identifying the genotypes of these individuals. Now in this pedigree, one of the very first things that I do having identified that this is an X-linked recessive is by first genotyping all of the males. Looking at the affected males in generation two, individual three, we can say that this person has the genotype of X, and maybe a little a and a y. And the same thing can be said about 
individual 5 from generation 3 and individual 1 from generation 4. Now we can also genotype all of the unaffected males by saying, well for instance, individual 1 from generation 1 as having X with a big A and Y, and individual 2 from generation 2 with an X with a big A and Y and the rest. Now that only leaves us with the females. Now in this case, one of the things that we can do is use the males as a clue to identifying the mother's genotype. Because when we take a look at individual number two from generation one, we see that she gave birth to a son who had this X little a, meaning that because she doesn't actually have the condition, she would have to have one X big A and one X little a. Now let's move on to our daughters, which are individuals one and five from generation two. Individual one is a little bit tricky, so we'll take a look at the individual five here first. Now you see that individual five from generation two also gives rise to a son who has this disorder, which means that her genotype must also be X big A and X little a. Now I said that individual one from generation two is a little bit tricky and here's why. Because it almost seems that we have no idea what her genotype is going to be. At the least we know that she has one big A, but we don't know if the other X chromosome is going to have a big A or a little a. However, if we trace her lineage down, she gives rise to a normal daughter but that daughter gives rise to a son who's affected. So let's actually take a look at generation three first and we can work our way back to generation two. So for instance, in generation three, individual two, that mother who gave the recessive X chromosome to her son must be X big A and X little a, which means that her mother would have had to given her the X little a allele, meaning that individual one from generation two must actually be a heterozygous individual. But that being said, individual two from generation four, yeah, we really don't know what her genotype is going to be. Let's go down to the middle here for a moment. Individual three and four from generation three. Now the son has escaped the fate. We know that about individual three from gen three but the daughter has to be a carrier. And why is that? Well, that's because her father had the disorder, meaning that she absolutely had to get the X little a allele from her father. Otherwise, she would have gotten the Y chromosome and she would have been a son. And that's not the case here. However, because she doesn't show that disorder at the surface, she must at least have one big A allele, meaning that her genotype is going to be X big A and X little a. While that may sound a little bit confusing, it's not really that bad once you start to write these things down. And another thing to look out for on X-linked recessive disorders is that, as I mentioned before, mothers tend to give her sons the disorder and fathers tend to produce carrier daughters. And if you remember those two things, then it'll be easy. And there are some cases where you do get pedigrees where females have the X-linked recessive disorder, but that is pretty rare and you have to have an affected father and at least a carrier mother producing a daughter who is affected with that X-linked recessive disorder. Now for the special type of inheritance that I did not include in the three, that is mitochondrial inheritance. Mitochondrial inheritance is essentially the inheritance of DNA that is found within the mitochondria. And the reason that this appears so different is that mitochondria is only maternally inherited. And the reason for this is that during conception, the egg contributes all of the organelles while the sperm only contributes the nucleic acid, which means that all of the mitochondria that you get, whether you're a male or a female, are received from the mother, which means that you should expect to see a 100% maternal inheritance in mitochondrial DNA inheritance. Let's take a closer look. So you can see in this image that individual two Two is affected and she's a female. Notice how she gives rise to a son, a daughter, a son and a daughter, and they're all affected. But when you take a look at the third generation, those sons do not pass on that disorder to any of their offspring, but the daughters, 100%. And this is the way that it works. And once again, this is very different from any other pedigree pattern that we've seen before. However, it has come out on an AP bio exam before. So it's definitely something to keep in mind, but it looks really obvious when you see it. So just make sure that you don't forget it. So guys, that's gonna do it for today. Hopefully you'll now have a better approach to solving pedigree problems by using the process of elimination and nail it every single time. And if you found this video helpful, please subscribe to our channel. It means a lot to us and click the like button and perhaps the bell icon so you can follow us whenever we drop the next video. This has been Mikey with Able Prep Academy. Have a great day.